Okay, okay. Hi, so before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land. Uh, we're in, a, I'm in Brisbane, so it's Yugara country, and uh, yeah, I pay respects to um, the elders past, present, and emerging. So today I am going to talk about this part of my uh, PhD project about um, screening scale insects for different endosymbiont species. So, uh, Intracellular endosymbionts, they come, uh, they come from many different uh, uh, groups of bacteria um, and they've convergently evolved, many different species have convergently evolved to uh, treat insects as um, their primary environment in which they live. Um, so they can have a range of different influences on their insect hosts. So you can have parasitic uh, endosymbionts and mutualist endosymbionts. And often these species will, um, often these species will uh, demonstrate a wide range of uh, facultative um, impacts on, depending on the host geography and the co-evolutionary history that um, these endosymbionts share with their hosts. So for instance, the very famous Wolbachia papientis is a mutualist in nematodes, but is often a reproductive manipulator in insects. So intracellular endosymbionts can be spread via horizontal or vertical transmission. So horizontal through like predation, crowding, such as in woodlouse, shared food sources, which is very common in phytophagous insects, such as scales, um, and then maternal inheritance, um, yeah, through the maternal line. So uh, all multicellular organisms are essentially sort of like an environment themselves and that the ecosystem and the, um, the environment in which these endosymbionts live is an ecosystem within itself. And so this collective group is known as the holobiont and they affect each other's ecology and evolution. And so it's very important to understand fully when you're looking at the evolutionary history um, and the ecology of a multicellular organism, especially something like an insect to consider the role that endosymbionts play. So um, with, is, if we look at the host insect as an environment, um, you can see that there will be different niches in which insects um, endosymbionts can uh, compete, um, compete for resources and to also live in. Um, so this creates many different um, dynamics that you would actually see in the macro environment happening within the host. Um, so for example, the uh, mealybug has a nested symbiosis with uh, Tremolia princeps and uh, Moronella endobia, where actually like a Russian doll sort of like symbiosis where um, Tremolia princeps, I think is inside, um, they live within the Moronella endobia. So um, the uh, host ecosystem, the uh, environment within the host uh, there's, is, um, there's a lot of different endosymbionts that can be competing and um, maybe even cooperating in order to survive within the host. And the infection statuses and um, frequencies of these endosymbionts can play a role in um, overall host survival. So in phytophagous insects, such as scales, psyllids, aphids, um, it's very common to see something like a primary endosymbiont, maybe like Buchnera in aphids, um, that uh, provide nutrient synthesis for the hosts because as phytophagous insects consume sap, sap isn't the most nutritious, um, uh, nutritious food source for them. And often you will see secondary endosymbionts which are less specialized to their hosts, but may also um, either be uh, uh, spread throughout a population through hitchhiking with the primary endosymbiont or providing additional facultative benefits or effects. Um, yeah, so these uh, interactions between primary and secondary endosymbionts have roles in even changing the phenotype of a um, host and uh, increasing or decreasing thermal niches, the types of diets that they can eat, or even providing um, 
uh, defense against parasitoids. So scale insects as part of the uh, phytophagous insects um, group also uh, consume sap and previous research has shown that they have primary endosymbionts that are um, either flavor bacterium or anterior, uh, part of the enterobacterium group. Um, and that also they have ant associates in the um, scale insects that produce honeydew. And so as earlier, I talked about horizontal transmission um, as a mechanism for the spread of endosymbionts. So to have um, a shared food resource like sap and to also have some species that are associated with ants, there's a high chance that maybe some endosymbionts are able to spread across species, throughout species, or even um, through within populations um, geographically. Um, so the research questions are broadly, this is a very exploratory kind of project, is just basically I wanted to see what other kind of secondary endosymbionts could we find in scale insects and how, what did that tell us about their role in scale insect ecology, phenotype and evolution. So um, previous research done by Asan from the Engelstetter lab and also Lynn Cook um, uh, has shown that scales, unsurprisingly, like many uh, insects have Wolbachia. However, um, even though Wolbachia is prevalent within scale insects, um, it hasn't really uh, been shown to correlate or um, contribute to any of the traits that scale insects might have that are typically something that could potentially indicate um, the role um, of a facultative endosymbiont. Um, so, uh, so we also have um, uh, some other endosymbiont species that we have seen in previous research to infect some scale insects. So um, as, the, as said before, there's the uh, nested symbiosis in um, mealybugs and also some cardinium in armored scales. So could other scale insect species be harboring endosymbionts other than Wolbachia? Well, um, as I mentioned before, it seems like they're all of the in, um, conditions for a potential uh, infection of endosymbionts is there, so it'd be interesting to have a look. So for uh, my scale insect screenings, I've just been doing a lot of PCRs and uh, <laughs> some of them are failing quite a bit, some of them, at least arsenophonous. I was gonna speak about arsenophonous, but I couldn't get much data because I think the stock primers are not working anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so that's, I'm looking at a Cardinium, Spiroplasma, Hamiltonella and Rickettsia. Um, and these uh, endosymbiont species I chose mainly because as secondary endosymbionts, they seem to be quite widespread among other phytophagous insects. And it would be interesting to see if um, the, uh, facultative effects that they might have would be beneficial for scale insects as well. Um, so, so far through my screenings, I've um, sort of mostly concentrated on populations in Australia across eight families. There are gonna be more samples, but I just have to get through them all. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just the uh, sort of range that I have. So uh, some preliminary sort of evidence out of the 38 species that um, I was screened, uh, we found um, so a high prevalence of spiroplasma uh, um, compared to the other endosymbiont species. Um, there's no Hamiltonella, which might mean that Hamiltonella, despite being a um, secondary endosymbiont of sorts, um, maybe might be a little bit more specialized within aphids as they do provide, as their name suggests, um, parasit uh, parasitoid defense for the aphids. Um, and previous research on armored scales have shown that cardinium is uh, a common uh, endosymbiont found within that um, family. However, we only found one sample with cardinium, but however, I haven't gone sample yet so we don't know maybe the ratio will switch once I finish the screening. 
but it is quite interesting to see that spiroplasma is quite prevalent across the species of scale insects. Um, and I think it might be to do with the fact that spiroplasma itself is a very old and diverse kind of clade of bacteria, which might, um, I haven't uh, sequenced any of these uh, samples yet, but it would be interesting to see through the sequencing what kinds of um, strains of, uh, and species of spiroplasma there are, and maybe to see what kind of effects they would have on their hosts. So I didn't find any co-infections within an actual individual insect, but I did find co-infections at the species level. So um, a common theme is that Wolbachia seems to be the main secondary endosymbiome that occurs. And then you have um, either Rickettsia or Spiroplasma. Um, so I uh, yeah, it's quite an uh, interesting sort of um, trend, I suppose. I didn't really see um, much of a uh, sort of trend so far in terms of species wise, except that maybe um, the, the uh, Coccidae family seems to have the most co-infections. But then again, this sample size is quite small at the moment. I was hoping to have a few more samples, but. <laughs> so then I also am looking at the distributions of these infections across a you know, geographical scale. And eventually I want to expand to um, across uh, different host plant species to see if there's any kinds of correlations or associations there. Um, at the moment, there also isn't much of a clear trend. And I also think that some of this might be like a sampling uh, bias of some sorts. Well, not sampling biases in, in the field. Well, yes, in the field also, but because um, I was just going through and picking out samples by species to try and maximize the number of species that I could, you know, have a glance at first. But obviously there will be population level differences and maybe even some uh, 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 geographic differences between each um, uh, host and infection status. So again, well, back here is the most common um, and yeah. So future directions, this is a very, uh, it's in its infancy, this part of my project. So I'm gonna finish all of the samples screenings and then I'm gonna do some Sanger sequencing and maybe some 16S metabarcoding on some select uh, individuals just to see their whole microbiome and also see if there's any endosymbionts that I might be missing because I did choose five of the most common secondary endosymbionts in the literature, but you know, obviously, all these uh, insects, maybe they have different physiologies that might you know, lend themselves to other species of um, bacteria better than um, other phytophagous insects. Um, and then I wanted to do, I'm going to do some variance covariance matrices to determine the correlation between different endosymbionts uh, within uh, species and also do the same with the plants. Um, just to see if there's any kinds of trends that we can look at as a sort of springboard to um, determine other hypotheses that we could make about why these relationships exist. Ah, uh, yeah, so thanks to uh, the Engelstetter lab and the Cook lab and everyone who collected all these scale insects over the years and everyone who kindly gave me a little vial of infected insects so that my PCRs could look legit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna get people to message you directly with any questions and we're gonna get okay. James up and running.